I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Weston to speak to us today about the doctor paramedic team and the management of pre-hospital serious trauma, including head injuries. Thank you very much, Beth, and, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me along today. Uh, yeah, it's a very good summary, and thank goodness you haven't given away all my trade secrets along the way. <laughs> Dread to think what you find on Google these days. Um, yeah, uh, it's a great pleasure to come and talk to you today on a, a subject which um, I hope you'll see by the end of the uh, end of my talk. Uh, I'm, I'm really passionate about, um, and I think it's really, really important, and, and, and it's really important the work that you guys do, and I'm sure from what you hear from the speakers later in the day, but... I guess I'm a bit biased, but I think what we do in those first few critical minutes after somebody's injured is absolutely vital in terms of uh, long-term survival or even or morbidity. So today uh, I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of, of air ambulances in the north of England um, because I think it's quite important to see what kind of resources are available in this region. I don't know an awful lot about the other air ambulances throughout the UK. Other than that, um, the UK is pretty well covered for air ambulances throughout, throughout the country, thankfully. I'm going to introduce you to the topic of the what I would call the critical care uh, team, the doctor paramedic team, which I think is, is vital. And I think a lot of people don't understand that actually it's quite different from the sort of standard rose crews that turn up at the roadside to, to the kind of service that we hope to provide and I think should provide nationally. Um, and it's all about enhanced pre-hospital emergency medical care. Uh, and I'm going to focus towards the end of it on, on head injuries as that's the topic of the day. And a slight caution, I hope none of you are squeamish, uh, but there are a few slides with blood. Uh, if you want to close your eyes or look away when they come up, I'm quite happy to do that. But I hope you won't faint. I haven't got my medical kit with me. Uh, next slide, there we go. So I'm going to start the... This thing isn't working, I'm afraid. I'm going to start the uh, talk by uh, discussing an incident that I went to in October 2018. Um, I was on the helicopter that day on Helimed 5A, which is based, uh, I'll tell you a bit more about it in a bit, near Penrith at Langwathby. Uh, we had a doc obviously had a pilot, we had the paramedic and myself. We do carry blood and we have all the facilities for pre-hospital anaesthetics and surgery and so on, which I'll elaborate on a bit later. We were told about there was a, a, an RTC, a road traffic collision. They're not called accidents anymore, they're collisions, uh, in Workington Harbour, um, where a car had gone through um, a wooden fence and we were told that there was a 20-year-old male still trapped in the vehicle, but possibly impaled by a wooden post. Um, we had a flight time of about 15 minutes uh, from Penrith to the west coast. Uh, and when we arrived on scene, the gentleman was still trapped in the passenger seat of the car. He was being attended to by one of my colleagues from the, the, the local basic scheme, or the beep doctors that I set up, um, uh, Dr. Ferris, who's an a &E consultant at West Cumberland Hospital, and also a GNAS doctor, and the Northwest Ambulance Service and the Fire and Rescue Service and loads of police. Um, sorry. Um, so just a bit of geography. This is... Uh, does the red light work? There we go. So this is where the accident was at Workington. We'd flown from near Penrith here. Carlisle's our nearest trauma unit, uh, but our nearest major trauma centres are at Newcastle, the RBI, James Cook in Middlesbrough, and Preston down here. Obviously, Leeds, where we are today, is down here. There's also uh, Aintree Hospital a bit further south, uh, south of that. But the, the three major MTCs that we take patients to typically are, uh, depending on the wind and the weather and the distance and where we are, um, are basically Preston, um, James Cook or the RBI. We do occasionally, if Nicola Sturgeon allows, go across the border up to uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh and take some of the patients up there. We landed at Glasgow just recently. I've never been there before, but the helipad is right on the top of the 14th floor, perched over the edge of the wing of the hospital. If you're scared of heights, it's definitely not a helipad to land on. It is absolutely terrifying, but uh, we man managed to land successfully. So we flew to Workington, and uh, this is just a, a Google map picture of, of where the accident was. It's sort of right on the, the harbour front is here, and these two young lads have been sort of whizzing around down, along the roads, uh, gone through a wooden fence, and the um, horizontal 6x4 post of one of the fences had gone through the engine compartment, up out through the glove box, up through his right chest, and back out through his chest, and through the seat that he was sitting in. And he was pinned, and we were waiting for the fire service to cut him out. So, is this going to work? I did put a little flying in helicopter. Could you press the next one? 
There's some, there we go. <laughs> Flies in. So, um, I think the batteries are gone on this thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, this is the post here. Um, coming up through the glove box uh, where the, uh, the fire service had cut the post to get him out. You can see it's a massive, it's not just a stick, it's a proper post. And it had gone right the way through his chest. Um, sorry, back again. Um, so the initial examination, he had a two inch piece of wood sticking out the front and the back of his chest where the fire service had cut it. There was about that much sticking out. Uh, there wasn't bleeding too much, he was quite agitated, clearly quite distressed. I think I would be if I had a post sticking through my chest. He was breathing quite rapidly, uh, his heart rate was up, his blood pressure, we couldn't get it. Uh, he obviously lost uh, a, a fair bit of blood inside. Um, he had a reduced conscious state. We gave him some ketamine. Special K, I think, is one of the best drugs that we use in, in our armament. It's absolutely brilliant drug for giving pain relief, and we also use it for anaesthetizing patients. He was extricated by the fire service. Um, but of course, because of the post sticking out of his back, he, he, normally we get people lying on an extrication board on their back when they come out of, the, out of a, a vehicle. Of course, he couldn't do that because he had a post sticking out of his back. So he was sort of lying in the right lateral position. And at the point we got him out, he dropped his conscious level significantly. He, his blood pressure was falling and his pulse rate was going up. He was clearly deteriorating. And when we looked, listened to his chest, we thought probably at least one, if not both, of his lungs were collapsed. So we gave him some further ketamine pre-putting pre to sleep. Um, his, his wound was packed and we decided who was going to do what, which is really important. So the doctor who was already on scene decided that he was going to give the anaesthetic. Uh, my paramedic with me was going to assist him with that. Um, and I was going to do all the other things, which is organising the other paramedics. And then as soon as he was asleep, the plan was to do procedures called thoracostomies, where you make a little hole in the chest and allow the lung to re-expand. So the anaesthetic went really well, and uh, as soon as he was asleep, uh, I made a little hole in both sides of his chest uh, to allow any collapsed lung uh, to re-expand, which happened. There was a massive hiss of air out the left side of his lung, uh, left side of his chest, and the pneumothorax was corrected, at which point he was sort of fairly well stabilised. Okay. Uh, and so this is the, a picture, this is the first slide with blood on it. This is a back view. You can see his head is up here. The post is coming out there. That's his shoulders there. And this is Dr. Ferris doing the anaesthetic. We have, we have consent, he has consented to allow us to show these pictures. Uh, they are actually, the, we, the GNAS feature on um, more for helicopter emergency service program. So if you want to, if you're really addicted to that kind of thing, <laughs> Uh, one or two of us do feature on that, but this guy, then this story does feature on one of the episodes because we had the Turn TV with us at the time. So the anaesthetic went really well, and uh, this is John having put the tube into his trachea. Uh, we've made a little hole, put a, like a chest strain in the right side of his chest. There's another hole in the left side of his chest, and all his numbers um, sort of equalised off, and he became fairly stable. Thank you. Yeah. So we then packaged him. In lying in that position. I mean, it was no mean feat for John to, uh, Dr. Ferris, to tube him in that position because normally we tube people on their back. Um, but tubing him sideways on was, was quite a challenge, but he, he managed it, so it was great. Uh, he was stable all the way to Newcastle. It was about a 20 minute, 25 minute flight from West Cumberland all the way across the, other, the east coast to the RBI in Newcastle. We pre alerted the teams on the way, and he basically went straight through, almost bypassed A&E, went straight through A&E and up into theatre to have his post removed from his chest, um, which went very well. He had a couple of weeks in ITU, um, and uh, about three weeks later, walked out of hospital, missing half a lung, but did very well. And he came back to see us uh, some months later, and it was absolutely brilliant. It's great when patients come back and say hello, and uh, it, we really appreciate that. So the consequences of providing this level of care, I mean, I think if we hadn't been there, if we hadn't anaesthetised him, if we hadn't done the holes in his chest, uh, and he just had a standard paramedic land crew, and I'm, I'm not knocking paramedics at all, I've got some great friends that are paramedics, they don't have the skills or abilities or not even allowed to do the sort of things that we do, 
And if, if we hadn't been there, there's no doubt in my mind that because of his collapsed lung and his general demise, he would have certainly succumbed long before he got to any hospital. The nearest hospital to us with, from there was Carlisle, and they don't have cardiothoracics. So, I, you know, it, I've no doubt that he would not have survived had we not been there. So it's really important to put this level of medical input at the roadside. So national statistics, uh, unfortunately, as you probably know, there are still three or 4,000 people every year killed on our roads, and about 10 times that number ha end up with serious incidents as well. And other facts, um, trauma is still one of the leading causes of death in under 40s. Young people are more prone to dying. With GNAS, uh, we attend uh, sort of 800 to 1,000 incidents a year. Most of them, our bread and butter is road traffic collisions. But in, my, in our part of the world, up in Cumbria particularly, we get farming is one of our number one businesses and as recreational as well. We get a lot of tourists coming through. So we've got biking accidents, mountain rescue accidents, things like that, horses, a bit of industrial and a very small percentage of our work actually is sort of what we call medical, that's cardiac arrests and things like that. Um, and the cost per mission, about five, they reckon about 5,000 pounds every time we lift off. Um, so the charity itself uh, costs about five or six million pounds a year, just GNAS, to run. It's 100% charity funded. We get nothing from government, and that's the same for all air ambulances throughout the UK. We can talk about that another time if you want to come and have a chat about my feelings on that later. That's fine. <laughs> but, um, so the main message of the talk today is... Something, again, my, my, the, the biggest message is that doctors and paramedics, critical, highly skilled paramedics together can provide so much more than just paramedics on their own. And we need to be having much more in the way of the doctor paramedic team out there providing this level of care. And, and it's not just, if you like, any old doctor. It's doctors that are skilled, who are... Most of, all the doctors in GNAS are all sort of consultant level. And it's the same for all air ambulances throughout the UK. And the paramedics are very, they've been in the job a long time and they're what they call critical care paramedics. They've had extra training to assist doctors in these advanced procedures. So the idea is to get these treatments to the casualties very quickly. And it, we like to think that we can, once we're on scene, if we decide we're going to anaesthetize somebody, they're going to be asleep within 15 minutes and we're lifting off within 30 minutes. So we're not what we call staying and playing. Uh, sorry, yeah, not staying and playing, but we're not scooping and running either. So it's getting this kind of balance between the two. But then deliver people to the most appropriate hospital. When we do our fundraising and things, people often think, they come and talk to us and say, it's great that you can get a helicopter there and get the patient to hospital so quickly. Yeah, we do get the patients to hospital quickly. But the main message is, let's bring the A&E to the patient. Let's stabilise them right here and now on the roadside, in the field, on the hillside, wherever they've had their accident. And that's much more the message that we need to be getting to people, actually, rather than just scooping and running to hospital. So, bring the emergency room to the patient. That's the motto of the day today. Of my talk, anyway. Next one. Here we go. So, we're going to talk about the um, air assets in the, in the north of England. Um, so, we have, basically, we've got three main air ambulances. There's GNAS, that I'm part of. There's the North West Air Ambulance. There's the Yorkshire Air Ambulance, which is, covers this area. And um, ultimately, the Search and Rescue Coast Guard as well do often help us. We used to have the RAF, but they don't um, operate now as, as kind of rescue services all over to the Coast Guard. So 10-minute flying times from each of the bases. So um, this, this is where we are here at Penrith. Uh, that's our sort of 10-minute flying time. This is our other aircraft, which is based at our main headquarters over near Durham Tees Valley Airport. Um, then you've got the two Yorkshire Air Ambulances, one based down here at Leeds um, and the other one at, up at Topcliffe. This is again their 10 minute flying time and you've got two Northwest Air Ambulance helicopters based out of Barton near Manchester and one from Blackpool. If you look at it, there we go. If you look at it, oops, sorry, can you just go back one? Um, this is the 20 minute flying time. So if you look at 20 minute flying time, which isn't actually that much more than the 10 minute flying time, you can pretty much say you, we cover between us, between all the services, the whole of the north of England, which is great. So the Northwest Air Ambulance, they have three EC-135s. Uh, their top speed's about 120 knots. They've got skids, which is great for going off, uh, off piste, if you like, on, out in sort of fields and muddy fields and so on. 
Their patients are loaded from the left-hand side of the aircraft over here. Um, and, but the problem with their aircraft, when I've seen them, is that they don't have total access to whole of the casualty. It's more the kind of upper half. Um, and they carry, on one of their three aircraft, they carry a doctor and a paramedic. The other two aircraft have double paramedic crews. <coughs> Um, next one. So this is what it looks like side loading into their helicopter. As you can see, the patient slides in here, but their feet sort of disappear down a tunnel. And <coughs> so th and then the next aircraft, the, the Yorkshire Air Ambulance, they have two EC145s, which is slightly bigger aircraft. Their speed, I believe, is about 120, similar, about 120 knots. Again, they have skids, which are, are great. Um, th and they have side opening door, but they have better access to the whole of their casualty, I believe. And on one of their aircraft, they have a doctor and a paramedic pretty much most of the time as well. Uh, if none of the aircraft are available, and one of the problems with all of our aircraft, the three air, air ambulance charities, is that we don't fly at night. Um, we don't have night vision goggles and all that kind of training, and, and, and we haven't got pre-surveyed sites and all that sort of thing. So once it gets dark, the helicopters go away, um, and I'll come on to the next bit in a minute, but we, we have, between us, we have cars that we respond locally. So, but if we feel we need an aircraft at night, we basically have to call on the search and rescue helicopters. Um, which are, are great. They have, uh, but they're, they're based quite a long way away from the lakes and they're sort of scattered. I'll show you a map of where they are in just a second. Um, so they have two pilots, a navigator and a winchman paramedic. Um, and their main advantage is they can fly at night in a much worse weather than we can and they have winching capability, which is a tremendous asset. They are huge aircraft, <coughs> particularly the S92, the Sikorsky one, which I'll show you a picture in a second, and you can fit two uh, intubated, ventilated patients on stretches in the back of their helicopter, plus other passengers as well. They are big aircraft. Um, the problem is they are a bit slower, they take longer to get to the scene, um, and so generally longer to get them, particularly at night. Before they take off, they have to have a bit of a conflab as to where they're going and all this kind of safety issues, so it takes a good 15, 20 minutes or even half an hour to take off. And then it can take them longer to get to us. So you could talk about an hour to an hour and a half to get one of these aircraft to the scene. But if you're in the middle of nowhere, it's certainly worth something we do think about. And we do use them quite regularly. Okay, uh, so this is the S92. This is their, their big aircraft. And uh, the next one. Uh, so this is where they are all based. So here's Cumbria and uh, Northumbria and, and Leeds around here. We've got uh, Prestwick. Carnarvon and Humberside are the nearest. And you can see that's quite a distance away from anywhere in our region, apart from actually, well, obviously around in Leeds, it's not too far away from Humberside. And this is what it's like to be winched. It's great fun being winched up in and out of helicopters it's <laughs> if, if you've got a head for heights. But uh, I've been winched in and out of these things and the, uh, the old seeking helicopters of the RAF many times, and it's just great fun. It's, uh <laughs> Uh, the problem about us is that uh, the, the, aircraft, um, the air ambulances, that, as I say, we can't winch, so we have to land. And this is a typical view of uh, our aircraft landed in a safe place, um, uh, helping the mountain rescue guys. So that brings you on to, to our, air, our setup. We have uh, two Dauphin S365Ns. We've got some new ones, N pluses, just recently, which are really good. The sort of upmar upmarket version of the one you can see in the picture here. We can fly at 160 knots. In fact, the other day, I did a job over near um, <coughs> Maryport for somebody who was really sick. We had to fly across to um, Newcastle, and it was blowing almost 50 knots. Now, we can, we can just about take off and land anything less than 55 knots. So we, was li we landed right on the seafront at Maryport, and there was spray coming over the, the grassy bit where we landed as well <laughs> off the sea, loaded the patient up, and we flew to the RVI. We were doing 220 miles an hour over the land. It was absolutely fr fantastic. We, we made it from the West Coast to the East Coast in 20 minutes. Um, so, um, yeah, they're quite, uh, our aircraft are the, one of the fastest air ambulances you can get. We also have a side opening for the patients, so we load them in sideways, but we have access to the whole of the patients. So once we've taken off, we can unstrap from our seats and we can carry on treating the patients on the way to hospital. Um, so certainly patients that are anaesthetized, we're, we're often tweaking things and doing things and altering ventilators and that sort of stuff. So, you know, you have to be out of your seat and, and working on them. Um, and we cover the whole of the, the north, between the two aircraft, the whole of the north. We also now just recently have taken on a contract with the Isle of Man, so we, we are contracted to go across 
during daylight hours to the Isle of Man and pick up anybody that um, has any major trauma there because they don't have an MTC on the Isle of Man. The nearest is Aintree. So we'll pick them up, treat them, and then fly them to Aintree. Uh, we don't get involved in the TT. They have a separate kind of private company that organises all of that. So, yeah, we have a doctor and a paramedic uh, and a pilot. These are our... Sorry, yeah, you can come with that. Thanks. These are two aircraft. The older one, this is a changeover. Our slightly older aircraft is here, but this is our new aircraft here, which we've just got a few months ago. And this is... Oops, sorry, back again. That's what it looks like to load into the side of the aircraft and then inside the cabin... Um, Next one, it looks like this. So as you can see, we've got a really good access to the whole of the patient there. Uh, and we have three seats in the back, so we can usually, say if we've got a child, we can take a parent as well. Um, but if they're poorly, we put the patient, the parent in the front um, and, and, and keep the, 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 we'll need that sort of paramedic and doctor team in the back. Okay. So uh, what about training and things? So we all have to do specialist training to do this kind of work. And when, everybody, when any new doctor starts with GNAS, we have to do the standard two-week, what we call FEMCC course. There's a two-day pre-hospital anesthetic course that everybody has to undergo. And there's an aviation training as well. Much more for the paramedics. The paramedics actually do most of the navigating and the kind of the aviation stuff. They sit in the front left seat and the doctor's essentially what they call a medical passenger sitting in the back. So... Uh, uh, they do all the comms and the, the, the um, uh, radio work and that sort of thing. And then there's ongoing training as well. We, every time we're on base, we're supposed to do uh, simulations and training exercises and so on. And uh, every other month we have it. We all get together and meet up for a, what we call an OCAD, uh, Operational Clinical Admin Day, I think they call it. <coughs> um, uh, and then there are specific courses that we have to do as well. So there's emergency surgery skills. That's probably... I did that in a uh, course in Coventry a few years ago, and it's probably the most gruesome course I've ever done. It was, uh, we, we had these uh, people who donated their bodies very kindly, um, but we practiced things like um, thoracotomies, which is opening up the chest, amputations, things like that. So it's all <laughs> probably the most gruesome uh, day training. It was a very, very useful day that I've ever spent. And we have ultrasound courses, uh, uh, learning specialist uh, treatments in obstetrics and so on. Um, we also take on trainees as well. So we have two FEM trainees, pre-hospital emergency medicine trainees, um, every, every two years. And then there are qualifications to do the DIP IMC and the FIMC, which we're all supposed to do. <coughs> the equipment that we carry in, the, in our aircraft basically mirrors the level of work that we do. So we have an all-seeing, all-dancing monitor, which measures everything that you would, could possibly need. Um, it, we can also plug in things like central lines and arterial lines into it as well. We have a ventilator, we have chest drains, amputation surgery kit, a um, whole list of drugs, which I'll come on to next. Uh, chest compression devices, ultrasound scanners, and we've recently port, bought these um, fiber optic uh, laryngoscopes, which are things that help you with your intubating patients. Um, so, like as I mentioned, we don't fly at night, so when it gets dark, the pilots get scared and have to run away home. So the helicopter goes into the hangar and we get out the car. And uh, in, in our area, so from, from now, to, it's probably about 4.30ish, it gets dark, so from 4.30 till 8, we do a 12-hour shift, 8 till 8. So from about 4.30 till 8, we have a car. And then on a Friday and a Saturday night, we've now got a car from 8 p.m. through to 8 a.m. in our area, in, in the northwest and in the northeast. They have it on, on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday night, um, just roving around. And clearly, the idea there is to bring our skills, like I say, to the roadside, but then we have to transport people by road to hospital after that. And the, our car in the northwest, um, sorry, I should go back one, thank you. Um, we are um, contracted to do what we call hot retrieval. So if patients get brought into Carlisle A&E, for instance, or Workington, and they're big sick, as we call it, <coughs> we haven't come across them on the roadside, but they, they need a transfer to Newcastle, to an MTC, or down to Preston, the hospitals will call on us to come and we'll stabilise them in A&E. It's not an ITU to an ITU transfer, it's an A&E to A&E transfer and we'll take them by road to, the, to uh, Newcastle or whatever. Uh, the plan is though to have a car on every single night of the week, but in the meantime, uh, in, in what little spare time I have, um, I do this thing called basics where I have the boot of my car is full of the same sort of level of medical kit 
and I do it on a voluntary basis. I go out to road traffic collisions and all the same sort of things that we do with GNAS, but just in my own car. And we have now got 12 of us as part of the basic scheme in Cumbria. And uh, we've been doing this for about 25 years now. Um, and so we get called on as volunteers to go and help the paramedics. So, uh, thank you. So our call-out procedure is you get the ambulance service gets a 999 call. Um, they take all the details. If they think a person's big sick and possibly could do with some enhanced medical care, they will then ring our air desk, um, which is manned by a paramedic throughout the operational hours over at what we call Progress House, which is the main base uh, near Durantes Valley Airport. Um, they will have a look at it. And they might all immediately dispatch one of us, the nearest aircraft, or they might say, well, actually, need a bit more information, wait till you get a crew there, let's get a SIP rep, and then we'll maybe dispatch somebody. Um, or they might take the details of the reporting person and then ring the person themselves and even use a thing called the Good Sam app, which is an absolutely amazing um, app that is on that we can use, we, have, we tap into, where we will send, we'll, at the, we'll ring the person on scene and say, we'll send you a text, click yes, and it'll, this uh, Good Sam will then take over their um, camera on their phone. It doesn't uh, kind of interfere with the rest of the phone in any other way other than just the camera. And then the person at um, Teesside, the paramedic there, can ask the person at scene to point their camera to the scene using their phone and they can actually see what's going on at the scene. They can see the patients, they can see the car, crashed cars, etc., etc. Really useful app. Um, and it gives us a kind of eyeball of what's going on on the scene. And we've, we've many a time, uh, we were thinking of not dispatching to a job, and then they've scanned the Good Sam app, and they've seen somebody sort of blue and gasping, in a, sat in a, trapped in a car, and so on. So, and then we have dispatched, and so on. So it's a really, really helpful app. So yeah, the bread and butter, as I said, is RTCs. This is us landed on the A66 up at Stainmore one particular day. Next one. Uh, and yeah, this kind of stuff. So I'm just showing you one or two pictures of now the sort of things that we kind of go to. And there they are. They've extricated the driver from this vehicle. Clearly, with a sort of mechanism like that, you'd think he would have massive injuries. Uh, next one. Uh, and another one too. This is a, a car. Somebody trapped in a car here on the A66 near Threlkeld, near um, Keswick. So once we get them out, uh, we do our various procedures, and if they need an anaesthetic, like this one here, this is a pedestrian <coughs> from a different job, it's been anaesthetized, uh, we uh, package them up, uh, and this is what it looks like before we um, uh, set up to do a kit, this is our kit dump being set up, so doctor, paramedic, drawing up the drugs, it's all done on a checklist thing now. Um, we have checklists for absolutely everything, so particularly for doing an anaesthetic. Uh, before we do the anaesthetic, we want to make sure we've got everything ready and we maximize our first pass, minimize any errors, because we don't want to involve you guys <laughs> by getting things wrong. So uh, we try and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm doing it out of work, aren't we? But, uh, <coughs> so, but we, uh, we have to make sure everything is absolutely right. So we have checklists for absolutely everything, particularly for this sort of a invasive procedure. And this is what it looks like. The patient's been anaesthetized here, um, is now being hand ventilated, and we'll put them onto a, a ventilator in the aircraft before we take off. And this is us taking off on our way to the RVI. And that, whoops, sorry, just go back one. So that's the RVI helipad, uh, which isn't quite as exposed as the one in Glasgow. So we also, we're also teed up to go to major incidents. Um, when I first started doing this kind of work almost 30 years ago, I went on a major incident training course thinking, oh, I sl live in sleepy, quiet, old, rural Cumbria. I'll just tick the MIMS box because that's what you have to do. I'm never going to get called to a major incident, but in the nearly 30 years I've been doing it, I've been to all of these major incidents, including the Manchester bombing um, just recently. And uh, yeah, they do happen and they will continue to happen, unfortunately, both on a national and international um, scale like Paris and Brussels, um, but also on a local level as well. Um, so sadly. Um, yeah, this was just a picture of the, the dreadful tragedy of the Grenfell Tower and m closer to home uh, a few years ago we had a Keswick bus crash where uh, 64 teenagers on the way back from Keswick school to their homes out west uh, were in a coach which was involved in a collision with a car which then caused it to lose control, tip over on its side 
unfortunately, because nobody wears seat belts in coaches, particularly youngsters. Two or three of the youngsters were thrown through the windows here and were trapped underneath us, two or three fatalities and several seriously injured. So we had all three aircraft, uh, the Northwest Air, Am Air Ambulance, GNAS and RAF at that time came and uh, treated the people from here. So I was m medical incident commander for that. So what kind of skills uh, do we bring to the scene? Well, I've mentioned it already, the advanced airway management is drug-assisted uh, uh, endotracheal intubation is, is kind of the, one of the key procedures that everybody talks about, but it is a, a potentially risky procedure and we need to be very careful when we do these. Then things like putting in chest drains, the, the thoracotomy is, is, is kind of for penetrating chest injury, so we're getting, unfortunately, in this culture of knife crime, we're getting more and more of the penetrating chest wounds where people get stabbed and then they get um, blood around the side, around the heart, between the pericardium, the sac the heart sits in, and the heart itself squashes the heart and then they die. But if we can open the chest quickly enough and open the sac that the heart sits in, the pericardium, and get rid of the blood clot around the heart and sew up the hole in the heart or plug it somehow, then actually we can, there's a one in ten chance that we can bring somebody back from that situation. So we're all trained in doing, and we've done thoracotomies, cracking the chest, the clamshell, opening it up. It's pretty brutal, but it's the only way somebody with that sort of an injury is going to survive. And we do ultrasound at the roadside, we all sorts of other surgical procedures are trained to do, like amputations, joint manipulations. I can think of nothing better and sat more satisfying than pulling a foot back onto the bottom of the tibia. It comes back with a lovely clunk when it goes back into place. And, uh, but of course, we have to knock them out with a bit of ketamine, good old special K first, and then pull it back into place. Um, but we consider that as a, a, as a vital procedure, because if somebody's foot literally is off, the end, is off the end of their tibia, then they won't have blood supply to the foot. And the longer that's left, the worse the outcome for their foot. And they might even lose their foot, or certainly have a non-functioning foot. So the quicker we can get in there and pull it and get it back, well, that's my excuse anyway, uh, then the better it is for their foot. Um, and then, of course, there's all the special things like burns and paediatrics and obstetrics and things that we're trained in as well. So the drugs we carry, this is just a bit of a uh, run through of the sort of drugs that we carry uh, to help us with this. In particular, with head injuries, we carry hypertonic saline. So if we think somebody's uh, brain is coning because of the swelling in their head, um, and they're going down the pan because of that, then we give them hypertonic saline, um, and I'll come on to our SOP for that just very shortly. Uh, we can also give blood transfusions um, at the roadside now. So we carry four units of blood on each aircraft, and we can be restocked during a shift if we use that as well. Um, next slide. Thank you. So the indications for that anaesthetic are uh, compromised airway or anticipated uh, poor airway, such as burns. So somebody who's got inhalation burns, the, the mouth and the tongue and the, the trachea will begin to swell from the moment they've been burnt. So we can anticipate that's going to block off very shortly if we don't do something. So somebody that's got bad burns, we will probably preventatively almost anaesthetize them, get a tube into their trachea before it blocks off so that they don't have an obst obstructed airway. And things like respiratory failure, like the casualty I told you about at the beginning, he was going into respiratory failure because he got a collapsed lung, so that's why we wanted to anaesthetize him. And then the topic of today, the, the head injury. So your agitated, unmanageable head injury that's thrashing around, not getting the oxygen they need. They need to be controlled so that we can um, uh, oversee their metabolism, their carbon dioxide, the oxygen in the blood and so on, which will help their brain and, and reduce the amount of swelling that they're getting in their brain. And then it's just simply a humanitarian reason. So if somebody has a traumatic amputation or polytrauma and they're in a lot of pain and they're very distressed and so on, then we would probably anaesthetize them just to control things and get things under control for them. But at the end of the day, there's always a risk-benefit analysis to be undertaken because we're pro proactively giving people drugs. We're somebody who's big, sick, who's on the edge of the cliff, as we call it. We're giving them drugs to paralyze them, to stop them breathing, uh, which is a really invasive thing to do. And, and actually, we have to be very, very careful as to who we do that to. So children, for instance, we have a very high threshold for doing that because they can be very difficult to manage under an anaesthetic. So this is our traumatic brain injury SOP. Sorry, I don't know whether you can see it at the back there. It's maybe come out a bit small, but uh, we have a, a standard operating procedure for this. But the essential bits for this are that we maintain 
this thing here says maintain optimal cerebral perfusion. And that's what all of our techniques to do with managing head injuries is all about. Um, we avoid hypoxia, early administration of tranexamic acid, control their, the level of carbon dioxide they're breathing out. So if we ventilate somebody, put them on a, on a, a ventilator, and their CO2 is quite high, we will hyperventilate them for a bit to blow off a bit of carbon dioxide, which reduces the swelling around the brain. And we can do that very quickly. And that's one of the techniques in helping head injuries, to, to hyperventilate them a bit as well as giving them things like the TXA and hypertonic saline. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is about the blood pressure as well. So a lot of these patients, they don't just have an isolated head injury, although quite a few do. Uh, they often have other injuries as well. So if somebody's broken the femur or the pelvis and they've bled out into the pelvis and that sort of thing, then their blood pressure is going to be quite low and the, therefore the perfusion of the brain isn't good. So we need to improve that. So that's why we will give people with low blood pressure, blood transfusion at the scene, bring the blood pressure up and then anaesthetize them. And that improves then the circulation to the brain. Uh, and then otherwise, oh sorry, just go back one. Just that. So this otherwise is a standard C, which is catastrophic hemorrhage management, A, B, C, D approach to as we do with all of our patients. Thank you. Um, so when we anaesthetize people, um, we perhaps sometimes need to give them a bit of sedation first, so a little bit of ketamine or a bit of midazolam to, to settle the agitation before we anaesthetize them. And then gentle laryngoscopy, for, so be as careful as we can with these people to, so we don't affect the blood pressure too much. Next one. Here we go. And collars. This one here says, avoid using hard collars. It's interesting, when I first started doing pre-hospital emergency medicine, everybody involved in an accident got a neck collar, just by default. And there are some people who still do that, some paramedics still just slap a collar on. But actually there's a lot of evidence out there that collars do absolutely nothing for immobilizing your neck and actually make it much more uncomfortable for people that are conscious. And in people that have got head injuries, putting a neck collar on compresses the, the veins in your neck and increases the pressure inside your head, which will increase the risk of bleeding. So actually. I don't think I could remember the last time I put a neck collar on now. We virtually never put neck collars on just because they, they can worsen things and they're jolly uncomfortable. So this is what we're trying to do. It's, it's what we call neuroprotection for traumatic brain injury through ventilatory control, using other things, adjuncts like hypertonic saline and hyperventilation. And of course, a, a spinal care as well. As I said, don't use a neck collar, but we actually tape and block people's heads nowadays. So once uh, that's the other thing is, if we can anaesthetize them, they're not thrashing around as much. They're now quiet. Well, it shouldn't be thrashing around at all. And they're quiet, we can block and tape their head, so we've got good spinal control at that particular point. So, nearly towards the end of the talk, um, the total number of call-outs that GNAS do every year is about 800. Um, in this last year, 232 of those, I looked on our stats last week, were 230 of those were head injuries, and we anaesthetized uh, 72 of those. Um, so, just to finish off, the... Um, there was a study done by one of our doctors, Chris Smith, um, a couple of years ago, three years ago, um, when he looked at people with, who were big sick. There's a thing called injury severity score we use. I don't know whether you've come across that, but basically it looks at a whole list of things from blood pressure, pulse rate, and the numbers of fractures and where the fractures are and things like that and injuries in your body. And they come up with an injury severity score. Basically, um, it goes from 1 to 75. 75 is unsurvivable. But anything more than about 9 or 10 is what we would deem as big sick and potentially might die. Um, so Chris and his colleagues looked at uh, between, over four years, between 2014 and 17, the patients in the northeast patch who had injury severity scores of more than 9, um, whether they were treated just by NIAS, the Northeast Ambulance Service, paramedics alone, or by GNAS, or both. So, oops, sorry, I've pressed too many. So, out of those, there was in um, the, the, the group which were treated by GNAS over that three year, uh, four year period was 231. People that were, were missed by GNAS hadn't been treated by GNAS, but were still big, sick patients, and they were just treated by NIAS, was 1,200. And they looked at the survival rate about a month after 
they were, they'd been in hospital or whether they died when they were in hospital. And they came up with this thing called unexpected survivors and unexpected deaths. And they, I didn't want, haven't got time to go into the whole of the, the article, but if you want to look it up, it's a really interesting article to read. But basically, in the genus treated group, they had 17 unexpected survivors and no deaths. But in the non genus group, so the ones that were just treated by paramedics, they had no unexpected survivors, but they had 13 people who died who perhaps shouldn't have died unexpected deaths. A fairly salutary kind of thing, but it's it kind of, I think, I hope, and we need to do more research in this area. I think it proves the point that actually providing a critical care team, enhanced care with a doctor paramedic team at the roadside, potentially looking at these figures can make a big difference to survivability and people out there. So, in summary, I believe very strongly that we need to have a much more aggressive approach to the management of senior, serious trauma in the pre-hospital environment, particularly to do with head injuries. As you know, with head injuries, they deteriorate very rapidly, very quickly at the scene. And if you, if you leave it an hour or two down the line before they get these treatments, which could happen in our area with the distances to hospital, then it's probably too late. We need to be putting these um, things in place, the, the anaesthetics, the hyperventilation, the hypertonic saline, all these sort of things need to be in place um, much sooner, really at the roadside, if at all possible. We need aggressive management of serious trauma. So it's a balance between stay and play, don't stay too long on scene, they need to be in hospital, but they need those interventions. So it's a balance between scoop and run and stay and play. And it needs, I, I believe it can only be done by, at this moment in time anyway, with the way the paramedic service is, that we can only be done by a senior doctor and senior paramedic team doing that kind of work. The paramedic, uh, the College of Paramedics, I think it's going to be a long time before they allow paramedics to do anaesthetics and do these kind of interventions. Some countries do, so I think Australia, um, for instance, have paramedics able to put these kind of levels of interventions in place, but not in this country, and it's going to be a long time before we can do, they'll, they'll allow paramedics to do that in this country. And then, of course, getting people to, to the most appropriate hospital. It's not always the best thing for people just to be taken to the local hospital, even places like Carlisle, which is, I think is good in A&E. They don't have all the speci specialisms that we need to treat these levels of, of sick patients. And that's it, I think. Yeah.